My name is Hans Rasmussen, one of the ministers here at the Denver Church of Christ, and we're very honored to have you with us this morning. I uh, was going to preach this lesson a few weeks ago, and the snow got in the way. So uh, we're going to finish up our series, uh, Hashtag Joy, and our final in the series is A Peace in the Action. And uh, it's always good to, to have peace when there's a lot of things going on, and it's good to have joy no matter what. And I've been excited going through this lesson, really learning and seeing God's intent for us to have joy. And, uh, you know, a bunch of people texted in for the survey, took the little two-question survey, pretty easy. And the second one was, how can I pray for you? And I, I really do want to know that. Um, we're going to talk more about that later. But the, the first was just, you know, who's got stress? And m- sounds like a lot of us are dealing with stress right now. And, uh, you know, there's financial stress, there's, there's loved ones and families, tension, there's, there's, you know, all these different things. But, man, if you're feeling stress, you've come to the right place. Because hopefully God can minister to you today, help you dealing with your stress. And uh, it's interesting, in the survey, that the number one thing that people responded to, saying that stress is about their school and their job. Now, sometimes that's relational, too, because you got a jerk for a boss, or, uh, you know, or it's financial because they don't pay you enough, or, or whatnot. But it was school and job, then relationships, and then finances. So, um, and a bunch, it seems like you didn't have a hard time answering that question, you know, because there's just so many things that we can be stressed out about. Maybe you're stressed thinking about the special missions contribution coming up. May 22nd, you go, I don't know, I'm stressed about that. Or maybe you're stressed trying to get your kids to camp. And we've got great options for camp with the kids camp and the middle school camp and the, and the high school camp. All of them are going to be fantastic, but they cost money. And, and so it can be stressful there. But you definitely don't want to wait longer to register your kids because it gets more expensive the longer you wait, okay? And there is a hard cutoff this year, so you don't want to miss that. But that's stressful. But, man, it's totally worth it. I appreciated what Nathan shared of, man, the impact that was made and the different things that happen and how he was helped by going to these camps. And it'll make an uh, impact on you. And maybe you're looking at this and you hear it and you go, I don't have any stress. Well, you can just go ahead and go home. Have a great day. But... uh, but if you are feeling stress, let's look a little bit here together uh, in review, and we're going to dig into this, this last one here. Because we looked at kind of chapter one was this joy and suffering, that even though Paul is chained to another guy, a Roman centurion guard, 24 hours a day, he can still be joyful. We looked then about this joy in serving, and man, when we do what God created us to do, there's a joy that comes from that. And we looked at just the joy in believing God and in his promises and who he is and just this joy from knowing God and, and getting close to him. And then this week, we want to look at chapter four, just joy in the Lord. And, and you know, here is Paul giving this lesson about joy, and he, he kind of puts this out here, but if you're taking notes, write this down, okay? Point number one, in the Lord... We can find relational peace. We can find relational peace. And I'm grateful that we can have relational peace. Because he's chained and he's about to be executed possibly. And yet he's concerned about his friends in a, in a conflict that they're having. And I don't know, sounds like a, a good portion of us go, yes, I have relational conflict. And maybe you go, yeah, I can think right now of different people. Or maybe you go, I got a long list. I can't even think of all the people that I have a problem with. That's not a good place to be. But in the Lord... We can have relational peace. We can find joy even when there's a lot of things going on. In in Philippians chapter 4, in verses 2 through 3, he he writes this. He says, I plead with Udia and Synthiki to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, yellow yoke fellow, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are written in the book of life. Now, we don't know what exactly the issue was. And I don't know if you have a conflict right now with somebody, and you go, I don't know exactly what the issue is. Have you ever been there? Where you go, I'm mad at them, but I'm not even sure why. That could be what's going on. Well, but, but, you know, just sometimes there's things that just go, what, what in the world? And, uh, you know, there's a, a family reunion this weekend for, like, by, I don't even know how it works. I'm related to them somehow. Um, in Wisconsin, there's a family reunion. I was just thinking of different times at family reunions, and there's always that one relative, right? Where you go, you got to be careful around that one relative because you never know what's going to set them off, right? And they may go psycho over some, you know, very, you know, innocuous comment or something where they just don't know, and I can't find the scissors! And where are the scissors? And you're like, whoa, 
family. You know, you love them. And, and maybe you're thinking through your family and you go, you know what? No, we don't have anybody like that. Guess what? You are that one then. Because every family has one. Every family has one. I'm sorry. If you're offended, you can call Glenn. Um, but, you know, but, but, but we all deal with that. But when we're having those things, God says, God pleads with us to find peace. And Paul here is saying, hey, in the Lord, you can agree with each other. Does that mean that we, you know, no, somebody can hurt me and I just have to let them? No, not at all. But where we can find agreement when we're both trying to love the Lord and being together in there. And it can be great in that. And, and that's what God pleads for us. And it's interesting because he goes on in verse 4 to say, rejoice in the Lord when you feel like it. Rejoice in the Lord when it's not snowing on May 1st. You know, rejoice in the Lord when your kids are obedient the first time. Rejoice in the Lord when your husband fixes the thing that he said six months ago he was going to fix and you remind him like 12,000 times. No, no, no. What he says is rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. So how often does he want us to rejoice? Always. Man, that can be really t- tough. But, but, but it's, it's what we're supposed to do. It's what we're called to do. And in the Lord, we can do it. Now, a lot of us were at the marriage retreat last weekend. How many of you guys go, I love the marriage retreat. That was a good marriage retreat. Amen? I'll be honest. That was like one of the best marriage retreats. Uh, the, Tom and Kelly Brown were out here from um, Atlanta. I was like, someplace not here. Uh, they, were, they were out here from Atlanta. And just the level at which they shared and the stuff that they've gone through. But then, you know, I was talking to him kind of outside the class even, and he's just like, man, my marriage is awesome, and we're doing the best we've ever done. And it was just really encouraging to see somebody who goes, wow, they were in the pits of the pits, on the verge of divorce, and where they're at now, I just go, gosh, God is good. But one of the things that he had said that really has resonated with me, he's talking about, what's your dominant spiritual thought? And he kind of alluded to it a little bit in the Sunday lesson, but I talked to him more about what he means by that. And he's like, you know, what do you think about? Because what you focus on and what you think about regularly is really who you become. And so in their church, they say, we've just been driving this home. What's your dominant spiritual thought? What do you spend most of your time thinking about? Because if we spend most of our time thinking about bad things and negative things and how horrible our life is, guess what? We start really believing that our life is horrible and that we can just never do it. And our spouse, they're never going to change. And my parents, they're such a pain in the neck. And my kids, they're just doomed. And we start to just, we start to believe it. But I go, man, if you're struggling with your joy, if you're struggling with your heart, if you're struggling with staying focused on Jesus, this would be a great scripture to commit to memory. When you're going, I just, But I'm going to rejoice in the Lord always. I'm going to say it again, Hans. Rejoice. I'm going to let my gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. And and I love that that's what Paul's encouraging us to do. And I don't know if this is one of those sermons that he preached to himself so he could preach it to somebody else. Because I'll be honest, like some of my best sermons are the ones that God had to like thump me on and go, figure this one out, figure this one out, figure this one out. Okay, okay, I got it. Let me preach it to somebody else. But... But I go, we got to preach to ourselves first. And so maybe Paul at some point figures out, man, I got to figure out how to be joyful and rejoice, chained to some stinky soldier dude. Because this is what my lot in life, but I can still make an impact. And he did. You know, we saw that earlier that, that, that he had become known in the whole temple guard and he had, had shared his faith with all these people and helped all these different people in a horrible situation. But rejoice in the Lord always. And this is one, I think, if we can ingrain it in our souls, and we can really, you know, own it, that it can be our dominant spiritual thought. If when you're going through difficult times, you think of this instead of, it always happens to me. Why does this always happen to me? It's not fair. Which do you think is going to be more productive? It's rejoicing in the Lord here. And so how often are we supposed to rejoice? Always. always. But it's cool because he goes on to say, let your gentleness be evident to all the Lord is near. You're like, that's weird. Right? What, what, is that, what does gentleness have to do with me being rejoicing? Well, it's interesting because if you look at the Greek in this, um, the, the Greek word for, for uh, gentle, uh, gentleness right here is epikase. 
And it means gentle, moderation, patient. The Greeks explain the word as justice and something better than justice. Where he goes, that's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be gentle. We're supposed to be patient. We're supposed to be moderate with each other. But it's interesting because what is justice for us as sinners? Death. Like, it says you, that's what our sins deserve. But it says Jesus came in and was a sacrifice for our sins so that we don't get what our sins deserve. Because God goes, hey, justice for you is death. But I've got something better. I've got something better than justice. I've got forgiveness, and I've got life, and I've got joy, and I've got peace, and I've got patience, and I've got kindness and gentleness and self-control for those who have been baptized into Christ. And I think for some of us, God's speaking to you today and going, there is a relationship that I need to get fixed, and if only they would change. Because they genuinely hurt you. You go, I could forgive them if they would just apologize. And there's probably somebody who go, well, I have no chance of working this out. Because they're dead. And, but yet Satan is still using that to, to, to hold you hostage and hold you captive. And, and unforgiveness, they say, is, is like drinking poison and hoping it kills somebody else. It just never, never works. But God wants these relationships to be better. And God wants to help it heal. And God wants to be able to, to give him glory by, by having these things become healed. And I think it, in these situations, you've got to do whatever you can do. You go, so it all depends on me? No, that's not what the Bible says. In Romans 12, in verse 18, Paul says this. He says, if it is possible. So you go, it's impossible. They've passed away. Well, then it's not possible. But if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with the people that you like. Oh, that's not what it says. Live at peace when people are kind to you. Live at peace with your boss when he gives you the raise that you totally deserve. But he's a stinker and he won't. No, it says leave at peace with everyone as far as it depends on you. I think God calls us to make peace. And is there someone that you need to make peace with? Is there somebody that you need to forgive, connect with? Someone that you need to, to have some reconciliation with? You go, but it's not just up to me. You're right, it's not. But as far as it is up to you, to make that effort. Because there's nothing that will steal your joy more than unforgiveness. And some conflict in there. So the second point is this. And if you're taking notes, write it down. In the Lord, we find inward peace. So in the Lord, we can find relational peace, point one. But point two, in the Lord, we can find inward peace. And inward peace is not the jumping up and down. Woohoo! Something awesome happened. Right? My team picked the right player. Woohoo! Well, the next NFL draft, you're going to have, you know, another woohoo or up and down and kind of thing. But see, God wants our joy to be an inward joy and an inward peace. Not just, oh, I'm fired up and I can make a show of it. Paul's waiting to be executed. And what does he say? It is thinking amazing to me what he says in verse 6. He says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Because that's what he wants. But so often, we can take this scripture and kind of flip, flip it the other way, right? We can worry about everything. Instead of giving joy and, get, and rejoicing in all these things. We, I mean, there's so much stuff to worry about, right? We can look and go, well, I'm worried about my hairline recession, I'm worried about my waist expansion, and now I'm worried about depression of thinking of those two things, right? You know, and you can pick your own three very easily. None of us have a hard time doing this. But, but what is worry? What is worry? I think worry is the sin of distrusting the promises and the power of God. That's what worry is. What's interesting to me, God never panics. Do you panic ever? I panic once in a while. You know, they're thinking, oh my gosh, what's going on here? And it, you can have that <gasps> kind of moments. God never has those. That's kind of cool that, that, that he, doesn't, he doesn't wake up and go, what is going on? Have you ever had those mornings? I've had those mornings where you get up and you're like, I hurt from places I didn't know I could hurt from. And I don't know why. And I take two steps and I look back at the bed and I think, what did you do to me? 
God never has those things. He doesn't look back at the day and go, how did this happen? He's not surprised. He's not worried. He never panics. He doesn't know. He never has those times where he goes, I don't know what to do. And yet we do. And when we worry, we're just in sin, not trusting the power and the promises of God. So how do we get past worrying about all these things? Well, I think we're supposed to worry about nothing and pray about everything. And it's so easy to worry about everything and pray about nothing. But man, it makes a difference, our prayers. You know, one of the other things that, that Tom Brown, as we were talking, uh, he, he said, hey, is there anything I can pray for you about? I said, actually, yes. And we had, you know, gave him some things. And just yesterday morning, he texted me. He goes, hey, I was praying for you. And da, 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 how's it going? And I'm so grateful that he's praying for me. You know, this year I've really committed to, to really praying through and um, the different prayer requests from people. And I've got a lot. And it's been so good, though, as, I, as I've been praying through different people. At one of the men's midweek, I said, hey, is there any way that we can pray for you? I took all those and I typed them up into my prayer list and I'm going through. And it's cool as I've seen different prayers be answered. And, and, and seeing that, but praying about everything. But it's so easy to not do that and worry about everything and pray about nothing. And it just isn't good. And I, do how to, I know how to say nothing. I was trying to do it for impact, but I know an English teacher just gave me a look, but it's okay. Um, but focusing on prayer, I think it, it's so good because it helps us cast our anxiety on him who can take it away. And we're resting in him and, and just praying for all these different things. And, and so if, if you took the survey, it probably popped up then saying, hey, how can I pray for you? I really do want to know and I really will pray for you. Um, but, but please do that. But it, it, Paul in verse 8 goes on and says this. He says, finally, brothers... Whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I think, what is he saying? He's saying, what is your spiritual dominant thought here? What's your dominant spiritual thought? What are you focused on? Is it pure? Is it lovely? Is it admirable? Or is it garbage? He's saying, focus on the right things. I've really loved writing down things that I'm grateful for and thankful for. And honestly, there's been a few days where I go, okay, this is a hard one because what's my good news today? I can't think of one right off the top of my head. And I got to dig a little bit. But man, it's not hard to find the, here's the things I'm not happy about stuff, right? And yet God goes, no, 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 no. Focus on the good because there is good. But sometimes you're missing it. And we're supposed to be thankful to God always. And he says, hey, learn from others. And if somebody's getting closer to God and you go, man, they're just joyful, even when they shouldn't be, what are they doing? What are they reading? How are they praying? Maybe you just go, can we just have coffee and hope that some of that just kind of rubs off on me? Because when somebody's joyful, it does rub off. When somebody's not, it does too. And so maybe you're the one that's not. Well, to get somebody who's got a lot of joy to give and see, because they're getting it from God and you can't steal theirs all the time. But there's times where you just go, I don't, I don't have this on my own. That's okay. Walk stay, step and step with them to, to get closer to God and learn from others and help get closer to each other and start putting those things into practice. It'll help you. Now, this doesn't mean, okay, they do everything this way. No, no, no. I don't care how they do it. I don't care how they dress. Don't dress like me. You'll look funny too. But, you know, I, but go, man, how are they praying? How are they getting close? What are they doing? Man, I like that idea of praying through things that I said I would pray for. I'm going to start doing that. I can't think that would be a bad thing. I can't think you're going to be controlled in an unhealthy way by that. But we're going to help each other. We're going to be praying for each other. And we're going to imitate each other in this. Like, I look at different people where I go, wow, they're so faithful and they're so joyful and they're so committed. And then I want to learn from them, young or old. It doesn't need to be somebody older in you than the, in the Lord to get something from. They don't have to be older than you physically. There's stuff that we can learn from whoever it is. So the third point is this. Write it down if you're taking notes. In the Lord, we find circumstantial peace. Circumstantial peace. You know, because it's interesting. There's sometimes we go, it's easy to be peaceful when, you know, job's unhappy or relationship, there's some things. But when something really bad happens, some bad circumstance, that's when our faith kind of gets really tested. In verse 10, Paul says this. He says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you've renewed your concern for me. 
Indeed, you've been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need. I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. What's he saying? He goes, I've figured it out. Good or bad, i figured out how to do this. And, and it's interesting, because how do we experience contentment? Is that one that kids just figure out? You know, little baby Enzo over there, like, I'm, I'm, not hung, I'm hungry. I'm not content. Right? He's going to let you know about it. Like, scream it and yell it. And it goes, hey, I want, I, want, I want food. Or I'm done with that food, and I want rid of it. And, you know, change that diaper. And, and we learn contentment because we learn it. We have to go through these experiences. And, and I, man, it takes time and, and, and all these different things that, that we have to, to, to learn by going through it. And so I think for learning com- contentment, there's two things that I've figured out. And not well. But when I do these, it helps a lot. And the first thing is this. Avoid comparisons. Right? Are you not totally happy with your phone until they come out with a new phone? You're probably happy with your house until you see somebody where you go, wow, that house is nice. You're probably happy with your car. Maybe you're not. But you go, I get a new car and I'm happy with it. Right up until the next month, they come out with the new model. And why didn't I wait one month to get the new model? And now this, and I was happy, and now I'm not. Why? Because we're comparing. You go, wow, I'm happy with my spouse till I saw that one. <laughs> not me. Maybe somebody. But we can compare. I mean, honestly, they say that's one of the major dangers in pornography. They did this whole test, and they, they took men and women and sit, had them uh, rate their spouse uh, before they looked at pornography and then after. All the scores went down after they looked at pornography. Why? Because it's photoshopped, and it's perfect, and everything's there, and it's always ready and always willing and everything else, and it's make-believe. But it compares, and it kills our joy, and it takes away our happiness. So whatever it is, your husband, your wife, your job, your life, if you compare it to something other than what God has planned for you, you're going to be unhappy and you're not going to be content. So we have to avoid comparisons and avoid pornography in case you were wondering. Um, Then we have to cultivate gratefulness. Man, if you want to compare yourself to something, go to the third world and see how our brothers and sisters live. And they are so happy. And I remember visiting the, the hospital in Cambodia. And then afterwards, one of the brothers in the church just took me around to do these house visits with AIDS patients who can't make it into the hospital or, or don't need to be in the hospital with where they're at at their treatment. And so we're going around and we're visiting these, not even a shack. I mean, most of them are, they're, you know, the corners and there's plywood and maybe, you know, cardboard or plastic. And there's four or five people in about the area of this stage times two. No joke. And they're so happy. And this brother who's going around serving them is so happy. And I asked him, how, how often do you do this? And his English wasn't great, and so he's trying to think. And he goes, um, you know, maybe, maybe 10 or 12 hours. And I'm thinking a month. I'm like, wow, that's great that you're able to do this. I go, so you do that like every month, like 10 or 12 hours? He goes, oh, no, no, no like 10 or 12 hours a week. And he works, and he helps lead the singles. And he goes, I, I just want to give. And he, I mean, I saw where he lives and I go, good grief, not much better. So if we want to compare ourselves to somebody, we've got to compare ourselves to those people who've learned contentment and love and serving. And the cool part is, is that's what we're helping support. Help and support those churches there in Southeast Asia who are doing amazing work and, 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 and meeting the needs and, and really helping. And I think that's what God wants us to do. You know, we can have a lot and be discontent. And you know what? Because discontent, discontentment makes rich people poor, but contentment makes poor people rich. You go, I don't have a lot. Well, in contentment, you can be rich. Because we can look at these different things and we go, I, I, you can have all kinds of things and not be content with it. 
or you can have nothing and be content. You know, it's interesting. I, I heard a story of this, this rich man who was just feeling, you know, overwhelmed and all these things were going on in his life and he was just looking for peace. And so he, he looks to have this picture drawn. And he said, you know, I want it to be this winter scene and there's a cabin there and all the wind is blowing and it's howling and it's dark and it's cold and, and it just seems miserable. The guy goes, oh, okay. And how is this going to bring, bring you peace? He says, but, but through the window, can you just put a little fireplace in there with just a gentle glow? Because even if the storms are whirling and, and, and life is coming at you faster than you know how to handle, God says, hey, in me you can have shelter and warmth and peace and joy. There's so many things that can bring us down. The, the circumstances can be horrible. And, and unfortunately, we can't change circumstances. Well, this happened to me, and I didn't do anything to deserve it. Paul's in prison. Didn't do anything to deserve it except sharing his faith, preaching the gospel of Jesus. But if we change our perspective and learn to have peace no matter what, even when bad things are happening, I think that's what God intends for us. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. So he's going on talking about contentment. You go, how do you do that? We can't. But Paul knew the only way for him to do it is that through Jesus Christ. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. I can be content and be at peace and relationally and inwardly and circumstantially. And we can walk down this path that God has, has called you down. You can do it. You can succeed at making Jesus Lord of your life. You can succeed at being restored to God. And you can even be joyful. Maybe even if your child is going through this dark road and going down the right path. Or you can be holy at school in this world of compromise and sin. And it says you can do all this through trying really, really hard and never making mistakes. No, it says through Jesus Christ. I can do all this through, through working myself sick. No, it says through Jesus Christ. You can do all this through, through, through making your parents happy. No, only through Jesus Christ. You can do all this through membership in the right church. Unfortunately, no. It's only through Jesus Christ. I can do this through giving a lot of money on special missions on May 22nd. No, it's only through Jesus Christ. I can do all this through sending your kids to camp. That won't work either, but it'll help. But it's only through Jesus Christ because maybe that's where they're going to connect for the first time, either for second grade or all the way through high school. And connecting something. And so I can do all this through, you know, coming to church on Sunday or being a better person or giving more, or serving more, or being more, or doing more. And Paul says, no. The only way that you can do this, the only way that you can be content, the only way that you can be joyful in all situations, be joyful no matter what, is through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. There's no way that we can have true joy and true peace except through Jesus Christ. And if you haven't made Jesus Christ Lord of your life, you do not know what you're missing. You go, well, it's hard, and I have to give up all these kind of things. All of that is garbage. It is rubbish. We looked at that a few weeks ago. Compared to the peace that we can have and the joy that we can have and rejoicing in all situations. You know, so if you haven't sat down and looked to see what the scriptures say about how to do that, man, the person that, that invited you today, maybe you, you come for a few times, you go, I don't know anybody. Well, find somebody who looks happy and joyful and say, can you help me with that? And if they can't, they'll find somebody who can. And if you can't find anybody else, come talk to me. But people seem to be scared of me for some reason. I don't know. <laughs> but man, we'd love to sit down with you and help you see through the scriptures what God has in store for you, how he wants you to, to be there and have that joy relationally, inwardly, and circumstantially. And if you invited somebody, you ought to just ask them because they're waiting for you to ask anyways. But there's no experience needed you go, I don't know if I know enough to do that. You do, because you're here. And it'll work. You go, well, I don't even speak English that well. Well, that's okay, too. We've got Spanish speakers that'll help you and whatever, whatever you need. And, and just all you need is a little bit of time. And just ask them about it. Open up so that you can see what God has in store for you. See, God wants us to have peace in all the action of life. You go, it's overwhelming. But God has that peace, that shelter in the storm, 
that warmth that only comes from, from a joy that overflows in, in all the areas of our life. And that joy only comes from knowing Jesus. Why don't we stand up? We're going to sing one more song. And we'll see you next Sunday for Mother's Day. And uh, God bless.